Okay. This is uh, the way, so I hope you're in the right place. And uh, I'm not going to try to give you a picture step by step by step. Uh, you're getting a lot of comments at different points about the history of our organization. That's good. It sort of reminds me of uh, the Revolutionary War when you wanted to be a captain in the Navy because we had no Navy. All you had to do was own the ship, be the captain of a ship. And do you remember those ships? The first deck is where the men were and worked. There was a second deck where the lieutenant stood because he was going to repeat the orders of the captain on the higher deck because he could look over everything. Now, that's fine because he would say, prepare to sail. The lieutenant would pick it up, prepare to sail. The men would all say it, prepare to sail. And then they would do everything that was needed to do that. Pull up the gangplank, up the anchor. Now, that's a good system. It didn't have a speaker system like we have. Now, the only trouble is you've got a stuttering captain. And he says, R -r -r raise the flag. The lieutenant says, raise the flag. The men say, raise the flag, and they raise it up. Now, after six months go by, the lieutenant's getting infected with that. And uh, the captain says, Dr -dr drop the anchor. And the lieutenant was starting to say, Dr -dr drop the anchor. But the men went over and dropped the anchors. Another six months by high, and boy, everything was getting infected by this captain. And so, as they're sailing out, he said, sight the horizon, ha, sight the horizon. The lieutenant said, sight the horizon. The men said, sight the horizon. And the, well, they're looking out and over the horizon, men are shouting it. They finally see a British ship. And the captain says, P -p prepare for battle. The lieutenant says, P -p prepare for battle. The men say, prepare for battle. They get the cannons ready. They get a little closer. And the captain says, a aim. And the lieutenant says, a aim. And the men said, a aim. And they got the elevation right. And finally, the captain said, fire. And the lieutenant said, fire. And the men said, fire. And those guns went, ba -ba boom. <laughs> Sometimes that's what it sounds like. A lot of back, you heard this, there, here, here. But it's good for us to hear that. So. I'm to talk about the early history. On Thursday night, you heard our stories and how it began in Miami. And so I just want to pick up in some of the details there and go on to how we grew. In Miami, you remember that uh, after the weekend and Pastor Smith, and he's very important to the movement in Miami, he's a well-respected pastor and if he went to a pastor and said, you ought to consider sending people, they understood that this was something to look at. So I want to mention that he is really responsible for the strength of the Miami movement. But he, because he was chairman of the Board of Theological Education, he had a lot of meetings to go to. And so I was chosen to go on the first weekend. Father Barry called me up and said, we're preparing a men's team and we think you should come to the team meeting so you can start to learn that. And so that's what I did. We also said, now when will we have the first men's weekend? Well, let's see, there's six weeks of training. The weekend, that's seven. Maybe we'll make it nine or ten weeks afterwards. We found a date. So you know, I started that process. Now, it, it's easy. You say, well, what about the team? Well. There weren't any Lutherans, except a few who had gone through. So we determined the plan would be that the first weekend, the team would be all Roman Catholic. I would be the Lutheran spiritual director. Father Barry would also assist. And so we went through that process. Now, after the men's, the Catholic men's weekend at their closing, at the very end, Father Barry got up gets up and says, I want to announce that we're going to have the first Lutheran Crucio in a couple of weeks. And gave the date. And people kind of buzzed. There's over 200 people there. And uh, <laughs> he said, but I want you to understand. I want one thing from you. I want to have you 
let me tell the bishop. Everybody kind of assented. He came off me. I said, you really going to tell the bishop? He said, yes, I'm going to tell the bishop after the weekend. Uh, he said, if I tell him before, he's going to say no. If I tell him after, he'll say, God bless you. And so that's how we, we moved in terms of preparation for that. The first team, all Roman Catholic, there were a few Lutherans that helped in the background and had a chance to be learning the process. And so the first weekend we had over 20, I think 28 candidates were on that weekend. And we had a very, as always, a very successful weekend. The women's operated the same way. And the third, of course, the second weekends were half Roman Catholic, half Lutheran. The third weekend were all Lutherans. And that's the plan that we used. And as we would go out in growth, that was the same plan. I have a Bible verse I'd like to read that, that says we were following a biblical principle. Okay, you saw that principle that we all know. Close to home, you know everybody, it's easy to tell the message. You go a little further, they know about Jesus, and it's easier to tell the method. You go beyond that, it's a little tougher, and finally a little tougher way out there. But you had that process of moving along, training, getting ready for it. And that's what happened in the movement, is that we started in our area, other churches, and grew right there. So that's important. Now, I, I want to talk about how things happened after that. And, and not strange ways, but natural ways, but we often don't think about it in that way. It's a variety of ways that we were invited to other areas. And I just want to share that with you. In Atlanta, <clears throat> how we got there was interesting. It was at an Eastern District Convention of the American Lutheran Church. It's a great Maine to Florida is the district. So when we got together for that, it was a chance to see old friends, a really joyous thing. I was walking down the hall, and Pastor Bill Corkish from Atlanta comes along. Of course, we greet each other. And he said, are you going to lunch? Let's go together. So we did. Of course, you start out talking about where you are and how things are going. And then he said, in Atlanta, there are five American Lutheran churches. We get together once a year and have a retreat. It's the responsibility each year of a different congregation to provide the program. He said, this year, I'm in charge of the program and I don't know what to do. And I said, have I got a program for you? So we talked about it went through the details of it, told him as everything that I could. And uh, afterwards, he said, that sounds very interesting. And I said, if you were interested enough that you would want us to do it, I can tell you I can bring a team. We'll bring all the things necessary for the weekend. And I want to say, tell you also, the team that's coming will pay their own way. That really interested him then. So he said, I'll go back and kind of talk at my church. And then they immediately called us and said they would like to do that. So we get ready. Now, what I'm saying is the pattern. And I won't say this for every area we go to. The pattern is going to be the same. All Lu uh, Miami Lutherans on the first weekend, second weekend, half Atlanta, half Miami, the third weekend, all Atlanta. So that is the general plan for that. Now, prior to that, though, while we were getting the team ready in Miami, I got a letter one day with a bulletin from the Iowa State Prison. And it said in there that there was going to be a Lutheran Crisillo. It wasn't the first one. They had, had already had a couple. Of course, when I saw the word Crisillo, Lutheran, I didn't know there were anybody else in the country, Lutherans, that were doing it. So I called the Iowa office and said, do you know who's involved with that? They said, sure we do. They gave me 
Pastor Jean Hermeyer's telephone number. And I called Jean. And you can imagine Jean saying, what? They're Lutheran Crucial in Florida? And we kind of talked a little about that and determined that we were going to somehow get together. And I said to him, do you have a weekend coming up? And he said, next weekend we're having one, a men's weekend. I said, if you, what time is the closing? He said, about six or seven. I said, if you can get somebody to pick me up at the airport, I'm sure I can get there before that. And so he said, if you're coming, then plan this then a couple days afterwards and we'll talk. And so that's how we got connected. When I got to the airport, they picked me up. We got there just in time for the closing. And when they announced about clergy here, and then they announced, you know, uh, we have a clergy from Florida who's with Lutheran Curcio. So you can imagine the kind of buzz that went on there. What? There's somebody else doing it? For two days, then after that, Jean and I talked about the weekends, what they do, what we do. We found certainly many, many things that were the same. And so we agreed that we should pursue with a network between the two of us. Before I left, I said, we're having the first men's weekend in Atlanta. Why don't you come? He said, yeah, I'll do that. I'll get our lay director. It'll be a chance to meet the leaders of your movement. We'll kind of see how you do the weekend. It will be a good way to get started. First steps to do. So that's how Gene and the Iowa group got connected to Florida and how Florida got connected to them. I want to say that those were the two strong bases that grew into the rest of the Crucial movement, Lutheran Crucial in the country. Okay, now, of course, Gene talks about the prison Crucial to our group. We had a Roman Catholic uh, lawyer who was with us right from the beginning and right on beyond that. And he said, a prison Crucial. When are you having your next one? He told him it was in a month. And Tom said, I'll be there. And so Tom went there. Now that's the beginning of us talking about prison Grisillo. So you can see the way the spirit is working b between the two of us. OK, now we talked about Atlanta. They got started. They went through stage one. They went through stage two. They went through stage three and said then, we want to start a secretariat. OK, so now what you do then is, how do we do that? We said, we will send people to help you to get started. And then, uh, as we go along, you can slowly wean yourselves off of us, and you have your own movement. Now, I neglected to say, is remember after our first weekend, what we had to do was, now what about materials? We've got the Roman Catholic materials. We want to put the imprint of the Lutheran theology. And so we had people looking at different aspects of it to get back together again to talk about it. We had pastors working, lay persons. What about the Pilgrim's Guide? What about the weekend schedule? All those things had to be worked through. And we were able to do that before the first call to go outside. Now that, so now we could say to them, we have materials that you can get. Now we still used a lot from the Roman Catholic movement because they were good materials and we were still working on how we were going to do things. So we we're able to do that. And that and certainly was very helpful in the beginning. Now, after, I wanna say after that, now what happens? Okay, their movement is going, we're growing and I can remember before I left Miami to go to a mission church, there were 100 people on a waiting list. And uh, that was the kind of support that grew. Now, mainly, you know, because pastors talked to pastors and people who went through the weekend uh, went out recruiting. And so we had that waiting list. That's always a good problem, but it's a problem. And the problem oftentimes is thinking in terms of size. You know, I, I think 25 on a weekend is the optimal. 
30 is still good, but there's a dynamic with that number of people that as you decrease from there, you have a good weekend, but you don't have the, what shall I say, the dynamics of a weekend where you've got that many. Five pilgrims at a table, two leaders, a lot happens. If you only got two at a table, it happens, but it's strained. Three pilgrims, that's a little better, but what if you have two of them that are very shy? It's tough to have the dynamics. Four is good. I like five, but I'd go back to four. And when you do your tables, I know the problem is uh, that we dealt in the beginning was if you got people trained to be leaders, but you don't have enough candidates, you feel obligated to have a table. But I know there are people who are willing to serve in other ways if you ask them to do that so that the dynamic can happen there. One of the things, what are some of the problems that arose in the early uh, movement? Well, one has to do with something called secrecy. You know, we say in the weekend, there's only two things you shouldn't tell anybody, and that's the serenade and what? Palanca. And that's all we say. You know, you don't have to, to do that. But it'd be nice not to tell them. Men came home from the weekend and they heard that, but what they heard was, don't tell anything. You got to experience it. And so their wife, who, their husband, is going out for the first time on a religious thing, and they weren't along, so they're eager when their husband comes home. He comes home and they can see there's some change in there, and they'd say, well, what did you do on the weekend? I can't tell you. I want you to go. In fact, here's an application, but I can't tell you. You got to experience it. And, you know, that causes some tension. So we had to deal with it. We heard that and said, yes, we got to deal with it. We stressed on the weekend. Remember, it's only the two things, but that's really hard. I think they need to take that statement out because there's nothing you can tell somebody the whole thing. They'll have the same experience that you had when you didn't know it because it's the weekend and what it's doing, not a couple of events there or whether they know there's idea. So our solution was, on Friday, we had wives' meetings. All the wives we invited in. And then we told them what their husband was going through. So when their husband came home and said, well, I can't tell you, she'd say, oh, which talk did you like? Did you like the ideals talk better or the piety talk? What? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Did you like the chapel visits that they have? You know, we really blew the men's minds that their wives knew that. We did that for about a year, and then things started to settle down. And we certainly had a lot of wives in, in terms of sponsors and that that could tell, and congregations that then did that. So we didn't have to do so many of them. But other areas, we passed that information on so that if that was a problem, they could do that. So that is a particular problem. Uh, one way that you can deal with it is to deal head on with it, and that's good. Now, I want to go on and uh, what about Atlanta? They have their Crisio group going, moving, they've got people coming in, and they're talking to their friends where they move from. Pastors are telling their buddy pastors over here, did you hear about this? And so, uh, an invitation comes from Pittsburgh and West Virginia. Atlanta says, oh, we've got a plan. Miami did. So we'll come and do that for you. And so that's how the movement goes. They did exactly the same thing. That pattern uh, is an effective way to do it. Now, also in Atlanta, Bill Corkish, He's been in the Eastern District a long time and been in several areas. People know him. And so people in North Carolina, uh, Chet Patton especially, former uh, youth director of the ALC. He's got a parish now. And they invite him to come down and put on a team. And I was fortunate enough to be on the first one. Same procedure in North Carolina. So I, that was a, a very successful way of dealing with that. So there are a number of areas 
in which we began. Now this one, remember the first one was pastor to pastor at a convention. The other one are friends talking to friends in other areas where they move from. So invitations come that way. Uh, we had also one in terms of Chicago. So, uh, first I should talk about Michigan. Tom Graska in Miami in business gets transferred to Saginaw, Michigan. I think it was a chemical company. Tom and his wife come. They get into their church right away. They start talking about Lutheran Crucio. They've got people at work who are Lutherans. They talk to them. Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, LCA, and he gets enough people interested. And he too says, I think I can bring a team up here. So he calls me, and we call Miami, and Miami says, yes, we can send a team up. So here were two individuals who started the process on that weekend, Tom and Judy. I think there are about 30, 31 candidates. They had 15, 15 there. Now I speak about the uniqueness of Saginaw. They do everything as we do, the program. The difference is Missouri Senate started with people on the first weekends. When they formed the Secretariat, Missouri Synod said, we'll come in and be part of that, but no communion on the weekend. It's the only area that doesn't have communion on the weekend. And that's due to, again, taking a look. If we want those people to come in, can we make that adjustment? But there's always some tension with people wanting to have communion on the weekend. That's a successful one. Now, Chicago. Chicago was unique in the sense, now, the difference of why we got an invitation there was I interned at a church outside Chicago, and I came back years later as an assistant pastor, and then, of course, moved on to another pastor after, a pastor after the senior pastor left, which was the policy in those days. So... When I got to Florida, that's where I learned about Crisio, but we had people coming down from Chicago to Florida who always stopped in to see us, and of course, I talked about the Lutheran Crisio. So this church, though, their Bible study group had been there for years, thought they needed some renewal in the congregation. It was really a growing congregation. And so someone said, gee, you remember we talked to our former intern at Simonson? He's got a program, a renewal. Uh, we should have him come up and do that. Well, they went to the church council and said, we would like to see something about this program and implement it here in this congregation. Church council said, okay. The pastor said, okay. Not only did they invite me to come up to talk to the, event, to the Bible study group, which then was the evangelism committee, that they invited me to preach on Sunday afterwards. And so I went to the committee, told them all about it. The sermon on Sunday, I said, will be something you would hear on the weekend. And then after that, we had another meeting, and they decided that they wanted to have uh, a curseo. This is one congregation. It's a large congregation, really fine people. And so, OK, I can get a team. I called Miami again, and they said they'd be willing to do it. I was in Washington, D.C. at that time. We had some people in Washington. But I said, the problem is Chicago, Washington, Miami. How do we support it? The answer was obvious. Gene Hermeyer, Iowa. So I called Gene, and they said, sure, they would be willing to participate and follow up with Chicago. So half the team was from Miami and Washington, half was from Iowa, and we had it together up there. Again, I want to emphasize that the uh, community, the Roman Catholic community that supported us in all of these areas, again, was supporting us in Chicago. They let us have their Curseal Center for the weekend, Al Capone's Warehouse. They even had a secret place over here. And uh, the interesting part, being Al Capone's warehouse, it was three blocks what was then 
the headquarters for the Chicago police. I thought that was interesting. An old building in a tough neighborhood, but in good condition. The chapel was spectacular. The Hispanic community had uh, painted the walls and had the Stations of the Cross in kind of a modern setting, but it was magnificent. And the acoustics were just out of this world. Uh, so we've got those units there with Chicago helping us. Well, it was interesting on the weekend, we sang the Florida version of De Colores, we sang the Iowa version of De Colores, we sang the Spanish one, and then the Chicago one. So you had your choice of De Colores. That was interesting in itself. Uh, so afterwards, they decided, after the women's weekend, that they would do this. This was one congregation with another one that participated. Again, we were going to help them. When they got finally to the point, and Iowa was following up with them, that uh, they were forming a secretariat, they didn't have a Lutheran pastor that was willing to do that. And up pops an Anglican priest, no Episcopal one up there, and he had made a Roman Catholic one, and he offered to be the spiritual director. So now we got an Anglican spiritual director, a Lutheran lay director. And they decided, because we had help with priests even coming and willing to speak, that the Roman Catholic would be. And I don't know how they got by the bishop on that one, but the three worked together. And they call themselves Ec Echo, Ecumenical One. And on the weekend, there are priests and Anglican priests and Lutheran pastors who give the talks. It's interesting. Very successful. They never really affiliated with the Vita Cristo, and I think because they had all these pressures from the Roman Church, the Episcopal Church, the Lutheran Church, so they kind of kept their own thing, and they follow the materials of that. That's really good. Okay, so now we've got a different uh, invitation coming along. Now, Iowa, of course, jumps into doing some work in, in Minnesota. And Minnesota probably today is the strongest of our units. And they have, it's always good to talk to them and see what they're doing. And I would invite you to do that. Let me speak a little about the overseas reach, outreach, New Guinea and Panama. Before that, I'll just do a little bit about the prison. And I just want to show something about Polanco, but also the effects, the effects of the Curcio behind prison walls. So I have a letter here, if you would read that for me. My dear friends in Florida, at first the best greetings from me. I hope you feel also as free in your heart and firm as I do. I am very sorry that I cannot give you my greetings in a personal way because the lattices and the high, strong, guarded walls of my prison do not allow it. You won't believe it when I say that I don't feel despaired in spite of my 19 years prison punishment. You will surely ask, how can a man be happy whose freedom has been deprived? It's not possible for him, you will think. Some months ago, friends, I also thought that this cannot be possible, but since I attended the 8th Prisoner Crucio, I feel myself much more free than any other man who enjoy his full freedom. How many people think that they are free? In reality, they are prisoners of themselves, of their passions, their cars, and so on. What is unfortunately missing by most of, most of people it is the inner freedom, the belief in the good, the belief in God. I am sure you will consider the life in another way after your crucio. If you open your hearts and you are going to take up the words of Jesus Christ and these of your friends, you can only be happy and glad. Now I am 27 years old and I had 10 previous convictions. I got to know all the badness of life. I never wanted to know anything about God. I thought God is only for old women. I felt very well without Jesus Christ, and I did not need him. You see what happened to me without any aim 
without making thoughts about the future. What a rough lad I was, of tough nature. My friends admired me and said, he shows it to them. He won't buckle under the bull. I am not able to say to you what a fool I was. In 1971, I overpowered two bulls and my two pals kidnapped a lawyer and his secretary as hostages. With the bull's pistol and the hostages, we forced our release of the biggest and most secure prison of Austria. During our escape, we kidnapped four more, more than 14 hostages. It was madness, friend, and I thank God that nobody took a serious hurt. I felt already myself being in South America surrounded by the most beautiful girls. The disillusionment was very bitter, very, very bitter. But I'll affirm you, friends. I'm going to fight for Jesus Christ and my friends. I'll go to the field on the top. My brothers in Christ, I would be happy to know that you are on my side. Jesus Christ and we are always the majority. Cheer up, brother. With all my heart, I wish you much courage and energy. Your friend and brother, Walter Schubert. That's, that's good. That's good. I remember uh, seeing in our national media and Time Magazine Newsweek because they went across Europe, and it was an exciting adventure to see, you know, and I think they got hostages, left some off, got some more along the way, and as they got cars, etc. But uh, several years later, now he goes on a weekend, and it changes his life. And now he's telling to those at Rayford on the first one what this could mean to them and what Christ could mean to them. There were uh, over, oh, I would say there probably was about 500 letters that came from all over the world, that being one of them. And uh, there's also uh, about 100 banners. And uh, at the closing, uh, they had heard that uh, I had been given on the weekends uh, a banner from wherever I went as thank you to the congregation for letting me go on the weekend. And they said, Pastor, we've heard about that. We've got a banner for you. And we want you to know that of all these banners, these hundred banners, that there is one that we would keep and would not give away. But we're going to give it to you to take to your congregation in appreciation. The banner said, Saints are forgiven sinners. Oh, boy, my congregation, when they got that, uh, saw the value of letting me go, but that message that those prisoners gave to us, what a message that was. Now, one of the things about prison cursives are we make a promise that if you, well, first of all, we make a requirement that if you want to be on the team, you have to promise that you'll be part of a, a rotating group that will go to the prison for one year afterwards on Saturday to be with the reunion group. That's the promise you make. You're not going every month, or you can go every month, but you've got to know that you're going to have to do that. Now, uh, Gene Hermeyer tells us about going to, into Iowa. Well, one day he had a, a prison. He got a knock on his door. A prisoner who was released come and knocked on his door to get started. So Gene fixed up a place in the basement, uh, a, r a room and everything, and they were gonna, he could be there, and he said, I wanna just get started. It will only be a few months. Well, it turned out to be four years, I think, he said, uh, concerning it. But that's what you, when you go on the weekend, that might be a possibility, so you gotta be ready to do that. Uh, we also helped, I know in Miami, and I, perhaps it's the same in Iowa, is we also promised if they came out, came to Miami, that we would contact them where they might be able to get jobs. And we wanted to get them out of their environments. So that's a part of the ministry. Now, just let me go to another area. Uh, overseas outreach, and just the two beginning ones. New Guinea Jean talked about, so I won't go into that. But remember how it started? The invitation was, 
a seminary professor from New Guinea, went on a weekend in Minnesota, went back to New Guinea and said, and talked to his associates, I think this would work in our area. So he contacts the Minnesota area group, Iowa group, and Gene Hermeyer again, said, we can do that. Now, I want to outline, he talked about going down there, but we, he didn't say, or at least I didn't hear it, was they said the team committed themselves for a month because a men's team had to go down and a women's team had to go down. Committed to a month, not because they were going to go sightseeing, but because they were going to be training so when they left to go back up, the area would be strong enough to hold its own. And I, it's been, what, 40-some weekends down there, so it's a real success. I was invited to go with the Miami group when they went to Panama. Now, how did that invitation come? Well, two Army chaplains went to a weekend in Miami, were transferred to Panama, and as they talked amongst themselves, they said, this might be a good thing for the Army base here. So they went to their superior officer in charge of the base and said, this is what we'd like to do. We would also invite the local churches outside. I know the Miami group will send the team down, so that's all we have to commit to. And, and we get a site. They're going to take care of even the, the site, and the team will come on its own and pay its own way. Well, they got approval to do that. So that's what we did. We came down at a men's weekend and a women's weekend. Now, what was different about that was it was hot. Boy, the afternoon on Friday, yes, Friday, no, fr no was, yeah, Friday, was so hot, we decided to start early in the morning, have a siesta in the afternoon, and then go into the evening. And it worked. It, it worked. And you needed that. That was too hot. I mean, the speakers had difficulty staying awake on their feet. It was so hot. To, and, but... We trained while I was there. My responsibility was I had speaking opportunities, but I also was charged to um, train pastors, etc., who were willing to do that. So we did the training in that, and Miami was to follow up with them. So that was a case of two Army chaplains. And I talked about Chicago and Michigan. And so that kind of shows you that the variety of ways that the movement moved. I'm talking about the early days. I am sure that those involved later would tell you about how it started. And a lot of times it's people who've gone on the weekend here and gone there to move, and a movement starts. And that's very important. Now, I want to say, who's responsible for the movement? Who's responsible for the movement? I firmly believe we say we are Lutheran via de Cristo. Lutherans are the backbone of the movement in terms of responsibility. You don't say, oh, that was really nice. Now we got these other people. They can come in and take it over and do it. What often happens is it falls apart. We've got a responsibility as Lutherans. We're the backbone of it, and we are to support it and make sure that it continues to grow. Uh, another thing is, and when I talk to pastors, is to say, and I talk to the weekend too, and I'm telling the pastor what I tell him, is we would not have this weekend if it wasn't for the local churches. We would not have this weekend. We are not a church. We're building on what the church has been nurturing you in your faith life. So when you go on the weekend, we build on that. We don't create something new. We build on that. So it's important. Now, the other factor I like to tell pastors is one of our large churches that had a number of people go through and who were on these teams traveling, the, the administra church administrator said, gee, they're flying off and they're paying all their expenses and that. I wonder how it's affected their giving. I mean, you've got an air flight to go, you know. Uh, they're taking off from work even. How is that going to impact on them? So he made a study of before they got involved with 
Crisillo and after. And the results were their giving went up 25%. Pastors like to hear that. <laughs> but I think that's just an outgrowth of our Christian growth, isn't it? And our response to what our Lord has done for us. How generous in his love that he is for us and our compassion. Certainly, we model that back. And so that's a good point. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I just want to conclude with, people often wonder why we broke away from the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Roman Cursillo, not the Roman Catholic Church, but the Roman Cursillo. We had such support. Iowa will tell you that, Miami, Atlanta, Chicago, you know, you know, all those areas that we went into, there was support. We were talking with the national lay director for the Roman movement. At one time, when we talked about that we wanted to be open and be ecumenical in a way, and he didn't have any problem with it. But somewhere along the line, the pressure came, and they did not want us to be ecumenical. So they came up. First of all, they were going to copyright the word Crisillo because they didn't want us to use Crisillo then. So they came up with a contract, and the contract basically said, you will be part of the Crisillo movement, and on your weekends, there will be only Lutherans, only Lutheran team members, only Lutheran candidates. And uh, the Methodists, the same way, had come up too. Uh, and uh, we were all trying to join together and be supportive to each other. In Miami, after our weekend, and the Episcopals had theirs, I invited the leaders to come to my church, and we talked about how we can work together. And it worked out beautifully. We shared materials. We, we supported each other's in closings. We were there for a joint menu that we could work. We, if you had a weekend, you had some materials that you could keep for the next weekend, no matter what it was. We saved. It was good, good support. And, you know, we decided at a national level we could do that. But uh, they said, no, you had a sign. And uh, they were going to take us to court. And I have a letter, and I didn't bring it with me, that Gene Hermeyer, he talked to an archbishop. And um, the archbishop was surprised that this uh, reaction had come. And he said, if you do go to court over it, he said, I'll come and stand with you. And uh, again, that was that support that we heard all the way along. Well, Methodists and us sat down and talked about it. And we said, it isn't worth going to fight over the name and give that image to the rest of the community that this is how Christians react to each other. So we decided to change our name. And uh, Leona told you the story last night. Uh, I always thought the Methodists beat us to the bunch because I liked the, there's a walk to Emmaus. Uh, that really is a, a catch, one that fits the weekend perfectly. We still do things together, like the prison, of course, in the prison one, they're not Lutheran Crisillos anymore, they're Kairos. Again, on the first weekends, it was Episcopal, Lutheran, and Roman Catholic. Methodists hadn't started into it yet. And that worked out real well, except the Catholics again said Catholics could not go on the weekend. We changed the name to Kairos. And nobody say they can't go on those, but it's that kind of venture. Uh, and Kairos is very important, and uh, it, it's something that we lift up. And many Via de Cristos also have that branch. And of course, there's the spinoff to the tech weekends too, and uh, they're very, they're not as structured as ours, but they kind of cover the same way. So you have a family. Mother and dad go on this weekend. Kids can't go until later, uh, but the tech brings that together. Now, just the last comment about Palanca as it's grown. I just want to say a couple different things in terms of Palanca. I want to stress that Palanca is prayer and sacrifice. And we've gotten into where 
love, what I call love gifts are coming in and crowding out what we believe Polanka to be. So each group has to take a good look at how they're handling that. But Polanka is very important. And I shared the letter from prison, but I want to share, have, share another letter with you that kind of shows, oh, wrong side. Yes, I'm over here this time. Would you read that for me, please? God is the reason we were put on this earth, so we should grow and learn about his word. We are to witness to each other about his love. God has given us his gift of his son, and he has given us the gift of his grace. And what have we given him in return? I did not always live my life with Jesus in my heart. I do know that I have my mother and father to thank. I have never experienced the Via de Cristo yet, because you see, I'm only 13 years old. But I do know that good things will happen to you and your life. My parents attended Good News Via de Cristo number 12 in Ottawa Lake, Michigan last April. And when they came back, they were whole new people who gave their hearts to the Lord. They're not Bible freaks or anything, but but now they go on with their lives, putting God first. And I am so glad they did, because my life is now a better one. Again, I am praying for you all. I cannot wait to someday be sitting where you are, a candidate. God loves you, and so do I, Tiffany Austin, future Via de Cristo candidate. Okay, that, that letter kind of shows you, it shows you, uh, since the past, mother and father who go on the weekend, and it changed the present for Tiffany. He caught that little note she said, things are better for her. It also shows the future that she wants to be on a weekend. And you think of that generation growing in, in families of people who went on Crisillos, now later on going on Vita Cristos as adults. And uh, that's an important thing. Of course, the question comes up then, to, uh, what happened to Tiffany? And some people came to me when I first used it uh, at the weekend at Capital University and said, Tiffany did go on a weekend and even had gone on, had served on teams. So, but you see the impact of, of Polanka. I just want to share two Polanka letters that I got on my weekend. The Catholics did Polanka a way that I really like. After the Polanka talk, they only put up partially what they received. When you went back to your bed, there were Polanka letters. When you got up the next day and went to the breakfast table, there were Polanka letters. When you finally got to the royal room, there were Polanka letters. And the same thing that night. Uh, a great impact on Polanka. Two that I remember that I received. One was by a, a woman who didn't know me, who said, this weekend I'm praying, not just for me, but for all of us, one hour on my knees each of the three days. And she said, if you know how bad my knees are, you know what a sacrifice it was. We laugh about that, but boy, did that touch my heart. This woman, bad knees. One hour each day, lifting us up, so Christ would bless us. The other one that I remember was from Tokyo. <clears throat> it was from a Catholic priest. In those days, remember, we had the brownouts. We had the electrical uh, energy crisis. He said, the lights are going out all over Tokyo. He said, I am lighting a candle. We all know that Jesus Christ <clears throat> is the light of the world. And while I pray for you, we both are praying for this Jesus. I pray that his light will shine in your heart and his spirit will come to you. That was a powerful, powerful message in terms of that. Now, what's some problems that come with Palanca? And this will be the last uh, sharing with you here. There are problems. You know, if the sponsors don't get the letters, what do you do? You know, uh, 
So let me just run through one. What we did was, uh, uh, of course, check off. And uh, they tell me, here are the letters we don't have. Now, it wasn't always a bunch. So after I gave my talk, The Day in the Life of a Christian, I would take some names, some other people would take some names, and we'd go to visit. If there was some particular problem, now remember when we had the wives' meetings, we could also ask them if they haven't written their letter, you know, would they write one? We also tell them what kind of letter to write. You know, don't write and say, everybody's well at home. Four of your children are fine, you know, don't do that. So we kind of tell them that. But there may be some that didn't write a letter. Now we looked to see if the sponsor got it on Saturday. If not, I'd go. And we often would get the letter because we told them more about it. Now, we had <clears throat> on, on a woman's weekend, one of my members was there, and her husband didn't write a letter. Now, I know Wilbur. I know him. And so he's not a member of the church, but he's supportive of his wife's work in that there. So I drove back to Hagerstown and went up and knocked on his door and invited me in and we're talking and I told him about the weekend, told him about on Sunday the letters come from the family and there's no letter. And uh, he said, well, she knows I love her and that. And I said, well, it's a matter of just kind of affirming her again. And he said, ah, she knows all that. And I tried several other approaches. He wasn't going to budge. I said, I just happen to have this card in here. All you have to do is sign your name. She would really appreciate it. All the rest will be getting letters. And he said, I don't think I need to do that for her. So next day, letters come out, and there's no letter there. And I went over and told her, I said, I really tried. And he really does love you. He told me that. She said, Pastor, he doesn't know how to write. Oh, I thought, uh, what a blunder that was. He doesn't know how to write. And here I sang all these things, and the poor guy must have been, you know, just thinking I didn't think much that he thought much of his wife. And it was my problem. So we checked those things out. Now, you heard me say about family. Now, in most areas, Sunday is like that. See, that's not what Sunday's supposed to be. It was never that way. Sunday was they're thinking about going home. So you have letters from the family and probably from their pastor. And four or five letters, that's all. They get the other Polanka letters before that. They're getting, they still get the other ones. But on that day, at that time, when they're thinking home, they get those. Great impact that way. Great impact. And uh, I rejoiced in that method. I don't like the new one, but I'm not the one to make that decision on that. But they still have the family letters on the top, but think of all, trying to go through all those letters. Now, there are two groups that go on the weekend. Um, there's three groups. First one, they just go through the list like that as they can. There's the second group that looks for family. There's the third group that looks for family and names of people they know that get read first. Nothing wrong with that, but it shows us, that's why I think Sunday should be that family time. Uh, Palanca is, is important to our weekend, and we need to, to affirm that. Um, well, I've given you kind of an overview of what we've tried to do concerning that, and I hope you have an idea what the early days did and can kind of look at what you did. There are still the same people going and talking about Crisio. There are still people answering God's call to be on weekends, to serve on the secretariat, to work with churches, and we believe that we're a tool. We do disappear. We tell them we're not a church, but we don't disappear. We've got fourth day. And that's really important for the life of a congregation. I mentioned that uh, just an example of what churches can do is there's one church that uses this. They started using small groups. 
They heard about Vita Crystal. They send people through. It helps them with their small groups, small groups people who haven't gone go there. They have a better understanding of small groups. This church has grown to be the largest church in, in Maryland. Has 20, last time I saw it, 22 re reunion groups or sharing groups uh, each week. 22. And that's part of the reason the church has grown. Grown so large. So it's important to understand that. The other I want to say is I want to commend all of you because you have jobs, pastors have churches, but we take that extra to follow God in this very special way. And it takes time, and treasure, and talent. And I know in my case, from the very first, I saw this as God saying to me, Ed, I want you to do this. Now, I was able to fly. I've been on 18 first weekends. I've been in 10 states and one country overseas, plus a lot of other things that I've done. And I was only able to do the funding because I told you the story of my parents being killed. And we decided to use that money in this way because they would say, yes, we want to continue that mission to the church. There are many of you who do that sacrifice too of time and talent and treasure in a very special extra way. And you know, I still believe that cross. When I pick that cross up, I see Jesus and I know what he's sacrificed for me and what he gives me. And when that drops down over my eyes, I see Christ is coming in you. And it's the very last thing at the day when I'm going to go to bed, I take it off. The very thing I see then is Christ is counting on you, and I say, how, how has he counted on me this day? And have I listened? God bless you in your fourth day, and may God continue to bless your efforts in Via de Cristo. Thank you.